Yeah, yeah, Isaiah chapter 8. The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. That's a name, by the way. And that particular name means quick to plunder and swift to spoil. So what do you think that would have to do with what's going on in Isaiah's time? Quick to splunder, plunder and swift to spoil. God is letting them know what's about to happen. That they are going to be plundered. And there's, their stuff is going to be taken. That's what they call spoils. When a, an army conquered a place, they went in and took their cattle and their goods and, and gold and silver and whatever else they had, and that was spoils from the battle. Okay? So he's given them this name. He's given Isaiah this name to write down, and that's going to be important in just a minute here, this name that he's written down, and we'll see that as we get down here in the Scripture as a sign to them of what is about to happen, especially to Israel. Now, it's going to come later with Judah. But remember, we've told you this before. It's going to begin with Israel. They're going to be conquered first. And so he says, I called in Uriah the priest and Zechariah, son of Zebechariah, and his reliable witnesses for me. Then he says this. He says, I made love to the prophetess, which means his wife. Isaiah is talking about his wife, okay? And she conceived and gave birth to a son. Now remember we in chapter 7, it talked about someone else conceiving. It talked about a virgin conceiving and bearing a son as a sign, right? You remember that? This child is going to be as a sign also. Now the one that we talked about last time in chapter 7 was Jesus himself. That sign would come later. He would be a, a sign to the people that God was who he was and that he had sent his son to earth and that he was going to live here and die for their sins and so forth. And Isaiah writes about all of that in the book of Isaiah. And we'll get to the part about the cross and his death later on in Isaiah. In fact, it's going to be a good bit later on. But this child is another sign for this very time, okay? Jesus would be a sign for later, okay? So you got two different sons being born here, all right, one to Isaiah and later one to the virgin, all right, and he says, she conceived and gave birth to a son, and the Lord said to me, name him Maher Shalal Hashbaz, which was the same name he told him to write on the scroll. Now, I want everybody to memorize that name, right? You got it? <laughs> Say it? No, that's, I'm kidding with you. <laughs> I'm kidding with you. Um, but this name, see, it, it meant plunder and spoils. So Isaiah is to name his child that. Now, how would you like for God to come along for your next grandchild? Or if, if you, anybody in here did have a child, that might be a miracle. I don't know. But if anybody, did, how would you like for God to come along and say, name them a name like this? But you see, their names, they were given names to mean something. We don't do that much anymore, do we? We just kind of name them what we like to hear. And what sounds good. But back then they gave their children names that actually meant something. So since this child was to be a sign, this name had the meaning as to showing them what God was about to do to them. Okay? And so Isaiah was to prophesy and tell them about that. And then in verse 4 he said, For before the boy knows how to say my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus or Israel and the plunder of Samaria, which was also the capital of Israel, will be carried off by the king of Assyria. So he's telling them they're going to be conquered by Assyria, and they're going to get their plunder and their spoil, which was indicated in this child's name. Okay? And that's going to happen before he can really put a couple words together. All right? So it's not going to be long. All right? It's not going to be long. Now, probably not more than a year or so. Maybe not even that long. Then verse 5 says, The Lord spoke to me again, because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, and that was a small channel that was leading from the Gihon River into the Jerusalem itself, into the city of Jerusalem. They've rejected that. That's the water that God provided for them, and it was a very calm stretch of water, okay? He says since they've rejected that calmness, in other words, and that peace that God had brought to them, and 
rejoices over Rezin and the son of Remaliah. He says, therefore the Lord is to bring about against them the mighty flood waters of the Euphrates. So it's going, it's going to be a flood that's going to come now. It's not going to be actually water. Well, you have to understand this. It's going to be an army that's going to come and destroy them and, and take a lot of them captive and that kind of thing. And so he's saying, since they've rejected my peace, I'm going to bring them turmoil. That's what we're, we're going to give them turmoil, which is what they were asking for. And because what he's really saying is here, they chose to look to another country, another king to provide their help and their protection rather than looking to God. Now there's a message there for us. Who is our protector as Christians? God is our protector. Who else are we to look to for our protection? Nobody. To God. Okay? And that's what he was telling them the same thing. Now, what is the problem with looking to others for our protection? Now, I know we have police force and, and all of that. I understand it. We have our army and military and all of that. But that's not where our trust and our faith is to be in. Because guess what? Even police can fail us at times. Even our army can fail us at times. They are men, just like us. And now women, too, I guess you should say. But they're, they're humans just like us, okay? So they can fail. God does not fail. God wants us to trust him and not trust in something that will fail. And that's what Judah and Israel were doing right now. They were going like to, like if you remember one point in time, they went to Egypt to get chariots and horses, you remember. And God had told them not to do that. Why? He wanted them to trust him, but they put their trust in chariots and horses rather than putting their trust in God. So God brought them down. Does that sound like anything that the United States might need to hear today? Huh? We've turned our trust from God into others, into, uh, into other people, into things, into our prosperity, into our wealth, so to speak. And you may not think you're so wealthy, but if you go to a country like China or India or, or some of those other Asian nations, you'll find out exactly what not being wealthy looks like. And you wouldn't fit in that category, okay? Okay. So God wanted them to trust him, and they chose not to do it. They chose to go elsewhere for their protection. And so they traded God's provision for the provision of mere men. Now, where's the common sense in that? <laughs> huh? If you really believe there's a God, and you really believe God is all-powerful, and you know other men are just like you, and they're no better than you are, why would you trust them rather than trust God, you see? But people do it all the time, don't they? This country has turned from God and is doing that. He says it will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, and sweep on into Judah, swirling over it. So it's going to start with Israel, and then it's going to come into Judah. But now God is going to at first save Judah. You remember back in chapter 7, when we read about Ahaz, the king of Judah, and, and Israel, and Assyria, or Aram was going to come against him, against Judah, you remember? And God spared Judah, okay? And so he was going to spare them for a while, but eventually the same thing is going to happen to Judah. So this is what Isaiah is talking about in this passage. If you, to understand this passage, you have to understand that, okay? And he says it's going to pass through it and reaching up to the neck, Reaching up to the neck means it will not take its head off, so it will not completely destroy Judah at this time. Do we get that? Okay? He's going to spare part of it. Remember, we, we've talked about that remnant. We talk about that all the time. When you talk about the Old Testament, you talk about the nation of Israel, and even when you talk about revelation in the nation of Israel, you have to talk about the remnant because it's throughout Scripture that he's going to spare a remnant. So he's going to spare, at this time, a remnant of Judah, just like later on, in the Revelation, he's going to spare a remnant of Judah when the Antichrist comes against them. But he's going to spare one-third of them. That's what the Bible says very clearly. Okay? He said, and it will cover the breadth of your land, Emmanuel. Then he goes on to say, raise the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. You might bring the war cry, and you might think you're going to be victorious, but God's going to take care of you. Even these nations that are coming against Israel and conquer Israel, 
even Babylon that comes against Judah and conquers Judah, God's going to shatter them. And he did that. At some point in time, they were no, he, he shattered them to the point that they were no longer world powers and somebody else took control of the world as, as a world power. We've talked about that, remember, in the book of Daniel. We talked about the different countries that were world powers at different times. And Babylon was one of them. It says, prepare for battle and be shattered. You can prepare all you want to. You can have all the weapons you want to. You can have all the chariots and horses you want to. But when God says you're going to be defeated, you're going to be defeated. It doesn't matter what you prepare and what you say. And this is some good stuff. I, let, me, let me continue on for just a moment. He says, devise your strategy, but it'll be thwarted. You can plan all you want. Now, how many of you know that Satan devises strategies against you all the time? Huh? How many of you know he, he wants to destroy you and he comes against you with plans and strategies to do just that? But how many of you know also that as a Christian he can't do it? He cannot destroy you because what did God just say? He can devise all of his plans he wants, but they're going to be thwarted. God is going to protect you as one of his own. So we don't have to fear Satan. Now we don't need to play around with him. Come on. We don't need to play around with sin. And we don't need to let him have a little corner in our heart to get started. Okay? We need to keep him out and God will protect us. Okay? We have to stand up to him. You can't give in to him. You have to stand up to him. And then God will provide the protection you need. And he can do nothing with you when you're under the power and the shadow of those almighty wings of almighty God. That's the way I like to picture it, as the psalmist did. And then he goes on to say, Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. And he's talking specifically, I believe right now, about Judah. God, as we said, is going to protect Judah for a while. Okay? Then he goes on in verse 11, this is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me. Listen to what Isaiah is saying, warning me not to follow the way of this people. In other words, what he's trying to tell Isaiah to do, and God, has, he said, has placed a strong hand on him to keep him from following what the nation of Israel is doing, okay, to keep himself pure to keep himself clean, to keep himself from following other gods, to keep himself from looking to others for protection, to look to God only. So God has got a strong hand on him holding him back. How many of you know if you want to sin as a Christian, you've got to battle the strong arm of God? I mean, that's the way it is. But sometimes it seems like we do it so easily and so readily, don't it? Okay? But God is doing all that he can to persuade us. He's not going to force you. He's not going to force you not to sin or not to look to others or any of that. He wants you to do that from a heart of love because you love him. And you want to follow him and you want to trust him and you want to obey him. And if you stay in that mode, he will protect you with his strong arm. Got it? Okay. So the Lord is warning Israel or Isaiah to stay away from sin no matter what the nation of Israel is doing. Preach the truth, prophesy to him the judgment and the warnings that God has given him, but keep himself clean and pure and keep himself trusting in God alone. Okay, That's a good message for all of us. No matter what this government does, no matter what laws they pass, I'm not preaching anarchy, but I am preaching to stand up for the truth that God has given you. Okay? Number tw verse 12. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. I think that's an interesting word because that's kind of what we're talking about in this nation right now. It's a conspiracy to control the boat. Isn't that right? But it, what he's talking about right here is these people who are calling conspiracies back during this time didn't have an idea what they were talking about. They were seeing everything as a conspiracy. And he's saying that's not the case. You know, some of it may be the work of God in judgment on the nation. Okay? 
And he wanted them to, un- he wanted Isaiah to understand that. He says, do not fear what they fear. If we are a Christian, we shouldn't have fear, period. That's the whole idea. God's, how many times in the Bible do you read, and it was even at the birth of Jesus that we just read several times during Christmas time. How many times in the Bible do you read, do not be afraid? Huh? It's everywhere. It starts back in the Old Testament. Uh, one, he told it to Joshua three or four times right there in one chapter. Do not be afraid. They were fixing to go into Canaan, remember? And they were fixing to have to fight for that land. He said, I'm going to fight your battles for you. Do not be afraid. So the idea is if we know we've got an almighty God, he is all powerful, he is in control of everything, and he loves us, what do we have to fear? Well, I can hear you, your processes going on right now, your thought processes. Well, you don't, you don't understand. See, this just happened to me, or this is happening to my family, or this is going on, or that's going on. and on. We could go on and on with all that stuff, couldn't we? Huh? But the idea is there is nothing for us to fear. God has got it. What is our job in this? Trust him, obey him, follow him, and him alone. And then he's got the rest of it. That's what he's trying to tell us, okay? Now, will there be rough spots? Yeah. But how are you going to learn to trust him if you don't have any rough spots? I mean, isn't that what Jesus had to go through to learn obedience? That's what, that's what he said. He learned obedience through what? The death on the cross. He learned obedience through death on the cross. And so God wants us to trust him and to follow him and to obey him, not to fear. And he says, do not dread it. Do not dread anything. You know, the truth of the matter is we should never have any anxiety. Wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't that be really neat if we never had any anxiety? The truth is we shouldn't. It's all, that's all on us. Because he's already told us who he is. He's already told us not to worry about it. And yet we just want to do it anyway, don't we? I mean, I don't know how to explain it to you. We want to have anxiety, I guess. Because we have plenty of it, don't we, sometimes? But he's told us not to worry about it, not to have any of that. We should not have any of that. He said, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one, in other words, another way to say it would be you are to treat reverently as holy. Okay? He is the only one you're to put on a pedestal as perfect and holy. Nobody else. That's why we can put our trust in him because he is perfect and holy. And you can't put your trust in anybody else because they aren't. I don't care who they are. They are not. He is the only one to be reverenced. He is the only one to be worshipped. He is the only one we're to put our trust in. It says he is the one, in that verse 13, he is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And the truth of the matter is, you only have to dread him if you don't know him. If you know him, and you love him, and you know he loves you, you don't have to dread God or anything he's going to do. Okay? So we don't really have to have that fear if we know him. But I guarantee you, those that don't know him, they better start getting some fear. They better start being afraid, and uh, hopefully it would draw them to God and push them toward him. He said, he will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. It says, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Why is that? Why is God going to be something that causes them to fall and to stumble? Is that on God? No, that's on the person. That's on the people. That's on the nation of Israel because they were stumbling and falling. Why were they stumbling and falling? Because they refused to live up to what God had given them to live up to. They refused to be the people that he had called them to be. So they were stumbling and falling. And they were fixing to have a big fall. A big one. Now what does that tell you about the United States of America today? Huh? 
if, if we are going to not obey him and follow his precepts and follow his calling, how many of you believe this nation was called to God and called by God to be a light, just like the nation of Israel was called? We've lost that light. We've lost that light. And because of us losing that light, there is a fall coming if we don't turn. Now, he gives us an out, doesn't he? If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. That, that's what it takes. That's what he's telling us to do. Then he'll heal our land. All right? But we've got to do that as a nation. That's, that's got to come about as a nation. And I don't see it happening right at this point. So if that don't happen, guess what? There is a fall coming. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how it's going to be. But there will be a fall coming. Now, some folks could hear me say that tonight and think I've lost my mind and think I'm crazy. But it's based on Scripture, folks. It's based on what I'm seeing, what he's talking about with the nation of Israel right now. And the nation of Judah is based on what he's done, he did to them, okay? Because they did not follow him as he had called them to do. So it says, he will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah, verse 14, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall because he is going to, here's the idea, he is going to be holy whether we are or not. And if we're not going to be holy along with him, we're going to fall. That's what he's saying. Okay, He's not changing. He's not going to lose his holiness just for us. All right? And he says, and for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Once again, the same idea. They're really trapping themselves because they won't follow him. Okay, they're, fought, they're walking into a trap because they won't follow him in obedience. If we follow God in obedience, there's no trap. <laughs> there is no snare. If we follow him in obedience, it's when we get out of God's will and we start doing things our way, and we start following our own selfish desires and inclinations, we fall into traps. How many of you know that's happened? How many of you have done that? It says, many of them will stumble, they will fall and be broken, they will be snared and captured. A picture of their captivity and their destruction as a nation at the hands of Israel, at the hands of Assyria, Judah at the hands of Babylon. He says, bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instructions among my disciples. Now, what does that mean? I, I think it means this. I think it means impress this warning on those who believe in me and follow me. Okay? Because the truth of the matter is the rest of them aren't going to listen. God knew that. You remember when he told Jeremiah to preach? What did he tell Jeremiah? Jeremiah. I want you to preach the word, but I'm telling you right up front, nobody's going to listen to you. God already knew they weren't going to turn, and so he was going to have to punish them. He had already set up what the judgment was going to be because he knew they were not turning back to him. But that doesn't excuse us who know him to preach the warning, to give the warning. We need to be preaching and giving a warning to the United States of America today. We need to be telling people. Those that we come in contact with. I don't know that we as this group here are going to change the nation, but couldn't it start in this area? Huh? God can take faithful people and work miracles. <laughs> He's done it so many times before. He's done it all throughout Scripture. He's worked miracles in this place already before. And he could do it again, and it could start here. And catch on and take fire, because don't how many of you know that God's the one who stokes the fire and gets it going, huh? I mean, he can do that. So he says, bind this up. In other words, impress it on his disciples and on the believers. And, and here's the thing. He says, seal it up. And because it's sealed, guess what? Nobody can tamper with what he has said. Nobody can change what he has said because he seals it. That means he binds his word. And you can't do anything about it. Nobody in here, nobody in this country, nobody in this world is strong enough to change God's word. Nobody in this earth is strong enough to stop God's judgment when he decides to put it down. 
he can stop it himself. Hadn't he done that before? Remember when the plague struck Israel and Moses prayed for the people and God stopped the plague? Who stopped it? God stopped it, not Moses. But it was through Moses' prayer that he did that. That's why prayer is so powerful. And so that's why we need to be praying. God can do miracles through our praying and through our efforts. We've got to be praying and got to make the efforts. Okay? So it says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. Now, wouldn't that be an awful thing to hear? That God was hiding his face from us. How would you like to hear that God is hiding his face from the voice of truth? Huh? That'd be awful, wouldn't it? We'd be better off just shutting the doors and getting out of here. If that were the case. That's an awful thing to hear. He says, I will put my trust in him. Even though Jacob's not turning, even though Israel is not going to turn, I am going to put my trust in God. And here's the thing, folks. If you end up being the only one in this entire nation that trusts God, you better keep trusting him. If everybody else gives up and turns away, you better trust him. Verse 19, or verse 18, excuse me. He says, here am I, Isaiah doing what? Presenting himself. Here am I, God. And he said, and the children the Lord has given me. You know, what I get out of that is this. Isaiah is presenting himself, but he's not standing alone. God has given him some faithful believers, I think, that were standing with him. Okay? And here's the thing. We need more and more Christians to stand together, to fight this battle together, to come alongside one another and to help each other and to disciple each other and work with each other and pray with each other and, and that kind of thing. And we need more of that here in this church. I believe that. And we're going we're gonna to work on that. So it says, here am I and the children the Lord has given me. In other words, I am not alone. I have them with me. You remember Elijah when he wound up in the cave after Jezebel threatened him. Most of you remember that story in Kings, right? And, and we're going to reference it again in just a little bit in another way. But if you remember, Elijah was praying like he was the only one who was following God at that point. And what did God do? He showed him several thousand other prophets who were following him. He says, you're not alone. You got all these other prophets with you. So you are not alone, Christian. You are not alone. There are other Christians that will come along beside you and help you and walk with you and help you to trust in God. He said, himself and these children who were following God, we are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. Sounds like to me there are very few who are believing at this point, right? But there are a few. He's not by himself. There are a few. And they were assigned to the rest of them that they needed to follow God. God had placed them there as a sign to these people that you need to stop and you need to follow God and you need to trust in God. Okay? Why do you think that God has placed you in this church? Why, why do you think that God has saved you? Is it just so you can go to heaven and, and be happy and hunky to worry by yourself? Huh? Is that what you think? That's not the case. That's not the case. He has put you here. He has a work for you to do here, and he wants you to represent him here in this place and represent yourself to other folks, represent him to other people so that they will come to him, okay? And that's what he had done with Isaiah and these children that he's talking about. Now, verse 19. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists, what would that be doing? Is that trusting God? <laughs> It's always an interesting thing to me that Christians can go to spiritists and mediums. I mean, I don't understand it. Why would you do that? I mean, they go to, you know, raise or bring the dead back and talk and what, whatever else they do. They go to get their future told so they'll know what's going to happen to them. Well, don't you already know what's going to happen to you? Hadn't God already told you what your future is? What more do you need to know about your future? He said, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists, to, in other words, to give you answers for life, who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? 
You know, why would you do that? Why not inquire of God himself? He's the one who's got the answer. These spiritists and mediums don't have the answer. He said, why consult the dead on behalf of the living? How did the dead know about the living? How can the dead tell you how to live and what, what to do? It makes no sense, does it? Why would you even do that, he's saying. He says, consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. You don't have to consult the dead and the mediums to find out that you're going to be judged and you're going to be taken captive and all that. Consult God's warning. God's telling you. He's letting you know what's going to happen. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. In other words, if they don't understand what Isaiah is saying, if they don't agree with what Isaiah is saying, they're in darkness. And there's going to be no dawn for them. There's not going to be any light coming at dawn to light things up. They're going to stay in darkness until they do believe. That's what he's saying. How do you think that describes the leadership in this country now? Oh, and a lot of people in this nation, how do you think that describes them? Distressed and hungry, verse 21, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Well, that'd be an awful state to be in, wouldn't it? You know what that reminds me of? You remember in Revelation, in a couple of instances, when God sends judgment on the people, and they go try to hide and try to protect themselves, and they can't do it, and instead of looking to God and asking for forgiveness and seeking him, what do they do? They curse God. They curse God. And he's the one with the power that's doing all of this to them. It makes no sense, does it? But it tells you how much that a human being can harden their heart against God. And that's exactly what's happened. The Bible describes that in a number of places in Scripture. How people harden their hearts to the point that they can't get to God. Sad place to be in. Verse 22 says, and we'll close with this. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress. In other words, the judgment, what God is, is doing to judge them, and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Kind of describing the end, isn't it? And the penalty of, uh, of the, it's kind of describing what's coming in the end in hell for them, isn't it? Those who will not come to God. Once again, very serious thing when you talk about hell, when you talk about all eternity. And that's why we need to be the light in this country, in this darkness we're in, so that more people can see Christ and so that more people can come to him. Anybody got any thoughts or comments or questions? We're going to end there tonight. Anybody? Okay. Jake, would you close us with prayer, please?